I'm just looking at you. I'm recording you. <laughs> Great. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for having me with you this morning. And first, just on behalf of Hannah and myself, just want to say thank you to this class because through the years, we've been in ministry a couple of years now, and y'all have supported us. You've empowered us. You've been praying for us. I know that for a fact. And before, when we were working with college students at St. Houston, uh, you've helped us leave a legacy there. And we actually just got to go visit with uh, our old college ministry two weeks ago. And we went to the service, and we actually didn't really know that many people anymore because it's been a couple of years since we were on staff there, which is a good thing. So there's turnover. The people actually graduated college that we were discipling, so they're having real jobs and things. And, uh, but the, the biggest part was they actually – gathered disciples themselves and have passed on what we taught them they've passed that on and on to other students so we love going there and feeling like we don't know a single person uh it's, it's fantastic that means the work is still going on god is still moving he's still uh getting college students fired up about the gospel on campus so it's a blast so thank you for supporting our work there and uh especially thank you for coming with us partnering with us i would say this class single-handedly has helped us kind of launch out to North Africa, which we hope to leave January 4th or January 5th. Uh, so like two, three weeks, it's hard to believe, but y'all just partnered with us so well. And we just want to say a heartfelt thank you. You are directly impacting people's lives through our family. And uh, now that we're moving to the Muslim world, you are going to directly impact people that we meet just on the street, like you saw in the video. Uh, people have no idea what's going on about Jesus, but we're hoping to meet them and give them a little bit of an idea of what's going on with Jesus. So I just wanted to thank you and give you a little overview. We'll be moving to that city of Tangier. That's some of our coworkers, some of our teammates. And we're moving to the city of Tangier, Morocco, a city of about a million people. And we're joining the church planning team there. And they, they did a good job illustrating what that looks like. And right now, it always fluctuates, but there's about 20 to 30 missionaries in the city of a million people. So we feel like, hey, we're on the team. We got the city of a million. We're going to try and win it for Jesus and then move on to a different city, different country. And most of the people here, they're mostly Arabs, 99% Muslim, mostly virtually no access to the gospel, no churches around, no scripture around, uh, no Christian neighbors, no gospel radio station that's local, uh, just virtually no access to the gospel. If they had a question, we see people are going to Facebook and YouTube. So there's some redeemable things about the internet because Muslims in this context, when they have no one to talk to, they just search YouTube, Facebook, and sometimes they find good videos, <laughs> some good preaching and teaching, and they're trying to learn themselves. But how much more effective would it be if, if they had a Christian neighbor or someone to walk out this life with as they answer these questions. Uh, I just want to quick show you before we get to a lesson, just four pictures that kind of help give a window to the world of what it looks like to live here. And these are some of our missionary friends that are there right now. So that first picture, Robert. Got it coming. Got it coming, NBC. So this first picture is from our friends, Ted and Beth. And uh, they just took this picture. It's a picture of their kids in front of a Christmas tree uh, in this part of the world. And she was just really struck as she took that picture and she was reflecting. She was really struck that these Egyptian women, they were sitting just, you know, 10 feet away from this giant Christmas tree in this, in this city center type place. And uh, she just encouraged her prayer team to remember them that they're sitting so close to a big representation of, you know, the Christmas season, um, kind of, you know, the Christmas holiday, what's it all about? But they honestly have no idea who Jesus is or what he's done or that he's even relevant to their life right now. So she was just struck by that irony. They're so close, but they have no understanding. And we know our friend Beth. She definitely talked to them after this picture was taken, <laughs> I'm sure. Uh, but that's kind of the, the pictures. They're so close to representations of America, American Christmas, but just no knowledge. And then the second picture, this is our friends that have moved to the country two months ago. And they were inviting some acquaintances over for dinner. That's our friends Cody and Kelly. And uh, they're reaching Arabs in Israel right now. They're all they stars. Just, they just got there. Yeah, they're all stars. It's the all-star team. So they just moved to the country two months ago. Uh, they're trying to meet people. They've, they've gathered these acquaintances in their house, and they had them over for a, for a meal. And this is what she said. She said, after dinner, we're able to share some stories of our families and our childhood. Building relationships can be difficult when you're the only foreigners living in the village, but we've been blessed with opportunities like these to share and get to know the locals. Just a very simple kind of Thanksgiving prayer to God, like, Lord, thank you that these people agree to even come in our house and visit with us and start a relationship with us 
So it wasn't any, you know, it wasn't any fireworks. Jesus didn't show up in the room and get them all saved. But it's the start of something where there's a relationship there and they're meeting Christians for the first time in their context. In this third picture, this is our friends that just hosted a Thanksgiving party in Morocco, Jason and Tiffany, and uh, we know them decently well. And this is what Tiffany says about the night. She says, these seekers were able to experience the atmosphere of our place and the hospitality of God. Jason prayed over the food and his local friend who wasn't a believer translated his prayer for those who didn't know English. And a couple comments from their friends were, I've never been invited to something special before and I felt so loved. I don't have many friends here since I'm new and I felt so loved and accepted. So again, just something simple, inviting them over for a meal into their homes, sharing the love of Christ with them. Uh, in that context, it's very relational, but there's something different when you enter a believer's home and the, the, we believe the presence of God is there and there's peace there. So people are just, you know, we're trusting their eyes are being open to the gospel. And this last one, this is what it kind of looks like. These conversations that we'll have over and over again with our Muslim friends. And uh, this is oh yeah, our friend Caleb. And they're, they've been meeting this guy for a while. And this is what he says about his friend Ahmed right here. He says, Ahmed said, I don't know a lot about Christians, but I know that they believe in three gods, which is, you know, a very uh, controversial thing. And Caleb says, my friend Ahmed, he wanted to know more, but he had never had the opportunity to visit with a follower of Jesus. And my colleague and I were able to provide a clear understanding of the gospel. And both of the young men they've been meeting with enthusiastically asked us to meet up again regularly in the weeks to come. And at the end of our conversation, we settled on the topic for next week. How can we know that the Bible is reliable? Hasn't it been changed? So these are, it's kind of to walk you through what does ministry to a Muslim look like? You have the same conversations over and over again. You try and break down the same barriers, uh, those same things they've been taught since they were a kid. Big objections like, hey, Christians believe in three gods, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They're polytheists. That's how they view us. Or uh, they think, hey, we believe that Mary had relations with God, and that's how Jesus was born. They believe that's what we believe, and that's gross to them. That's also gross to us that that would happen. Um, they believe Jesus didn't die on the cross, but God saved him before he died. They believe the Bible is incredibly corrupt because it's been translated into so many different languages, and everyone's had a hand on the Bible. And they say, how can you believe this Bible is terrible? So the, these same objections come up in almost every friendship with a Muslim person in uh, our ministry will be meeting with them, like like our friend said, just hours and hours and hours of trying to break down these barriers that have just been there instilled in them since birth. And it, it's fun to see the barriers come down. And a lot of times we hear from our Muslim friends, like, wait, you don't believe God had sex with Mary? We're like, no, we don't believe that. Are you sure? I'm like, yes, I'm definitely sure. <laughs> just breaking down these barriers over and over again. But uh, they can't be broken down unless someone's there to walk it out with them and, and show them, like, hey, this is not what we believe. This is what Christianity looks like. This is what walking with Jesus looks like. And Islam, uh, it's it's seen kind of as the, the premier missions challenge in the world. It's different from other world religions because Islam is just aggressive. It's in your face. It's aggressive. It was kind of founded on violence. It's been spread through coercion since its inception. And it's kind of a religion of power. And we feel the, that the odds are stacked against us a little bit living in the Muslim world because every year 42 million Muslims are born and uh, we're not seeing that many Muslims come to Christ. So just by birth rate alone, we kind of feel the odds are stacked against us. But we believe in Jesus. Amen. We believe that he does, doesn't matter that the odds are stacked against us. And maybe feel this in America that the, the tides are turning against the church. The tides are turning against Christianity. Uh, maybe it's not as accepted or mainstream as it, it used to be maybe when y'all were kids. We see that on the college campus. Uh, Jesus is not as popular. Following him is definitely not as popular. It's actually seen as countercultural. But the lesson this morning I just want to share briefly is with our brief time here on earth, you know, who knows how long it will be. It's the blink of an eye in a lot of eternity. But with our brief time, how can you and I make uh, the most impact and advance the kingdom of God. I want to share a few scriptures with you about the key to a fruitful life. So this is my book coming out, The Secret to a Fruitful Life. You know, good. <laughs> That'll make you buy it, right? The Secret to the Fruitful Life. We know it. Me and Hannah know it. It's the secret. We'll share with you for free. Uh, but as, as Christian, has a secret. As Christmas approaches, uh, so yeah, y'all preparing to travel to Florida. That's a big, that's a big trip. We, we did that trip a couple months ago. <laughs> but either if y'all are traveling or you're preparing to gather and host people, cook a bunch of food or do who knows what, uh, it can feel like you're, you're pressed for time. Maybe you're finishing things up. 
and you're pressed for time. We feel pressed for time a lot. Uh, and this is kind of a common human experience, but I want to remind you this holiday, if you ever feel pressed for time, just remember Jesus only had three years to fulfill 300 plus prophecies and to find disciples that would listen to him and change the world. He only had three years and he got it done. Let's so remember Jesus felt pressed for time and uh, he still entertained interruptions. So let that be an encouragement to you to that it's not as hard as Jesus said. <laughs> Pretty much, maybe easier job. But what was Jesus' secret to living so perfectly? He had 30 years growing up. He had three years of public ministry. What was his secret to just being so perfect? It's sometimes frustrating how perfect he was. Every conversation, every time they tried to trap him in questions, he's just so perfect. Everyone was always amazed at what Jesus said, at what he did. I want to be like him and amaze people and be famous. But, man, I just love reading the stories of Jesus. What was his secret? And if you turn to John 12, John chapter 12, verse 23, we'll park here for a bit. One of our famous scriptures, this scripture is actually the kind of the, the foundation for our, our church planning team, uh, John 12, 23 through 28, the key to a fruitful life. This is what it says. Verse 23, Jesus answered them saying, the hour has come that the son of man should be glorified. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. He who loves his life will lose it, and he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, let him follow me, and where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, him my father will honor. So we love this verse. It's very telling, and this is close to Jesus' crucifixion. It takes on a special tone when you remember that. So what is the key to a fruitful life? And uh, nature actually provides a great example. If you love just walking in nature, or bird watching, whatever you like. Nature provides an example. We've lived in Huntsville the last 10, 15 years, and it's in the middle of the, the Pinewood Forest, the same Houston National Forest. There's about a bajillion pine trees everywhere. And in the springtime, it, the whole town is covered in green dust, like literally on your car, it's green dust everywhere, just the pollen or whatever that stuff is. A billion pine trees. So we look at nature. What's the key to the fruitful life? How does nature reproduce? And when you see a pine cone, and maybe you have these in your yard, a billion pine cones. There's, there's little seeds on the pine cone, and those little seeds will eventually, if the conditions are right, if they drop to the right spot kind of far away, if the wind pollinates the pine cones and the seeds, eventually they'll grow into a giant pine tree. I think it takes like 50-something years, maybe more than that. But I was thinking about this. What if every pine cone – so the National Forest is huge. Have you driven through this? Have you gotten stuck or lost out there somewhere? The, the National Forest is huge in Huntsville. It's ginormous. I've gotten lost out there many times, a million pine trees. But what would happen if every pine cone, say it developed a will of its own, every pine cone said, I will not drop to the ground. I'm not growing. I'm going to stay in this pine tree no matter what. I'm going to be a disobedient pine cone. I'm going to go against the grain of nature, what God designed me to do. Then would there be any forest in a couple hundred years after we chop it all down? There'd be nothing, no new growth. And there wouldn't be any new growth because there's, there's no death. And God has designed things so that death brings life. And you kind of see it when a pine cone drops to the ground onto your driveway and you step on it and hurt your foot or something. God's designed it where these things drop to the ground, they fall to the ground, and the seed dies, it gets buried in the ground, but then life comes from that. And this is kind of the parable Jesus is talking about here. So what kind of people does Jesus want to use? Jesus loves using dead people. He loves dead people. If you're not dead, he's going to try and kill you. <laughs> he loves dead people because when we're dead to self, scripture says we can be alive to Christ. It's such a paradox that if you don't know Jesus, it doesn't make any sense that all these Christians are trying to die. It doesn't make any sense. But if we're alive to self, we're dead in Christ. So Jesus, he doesn't want to use alive people. He wants dead people so he can make them alive, so they can reach other people and kill them so they can be alive too. It's kind of this weird, morbid <laughs> kind of turn of events in scripture. And uh, I love reading how Jesus, he just mystified all, all the people. This is Galatians 2.20. This is Paul. I've been crucified with Christ and it's no longer I that live, but Christ lives in me. So Jesus loves using dead people. So my question to you, I'll leave this with you guys. What, what does this verse mean for us? What is Paul getting at here when he says Galatians 2.20? I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I that live but Christ lives in me. 
So was Paul, was he on the cross with Christ? How can he say that I've been crucified with, with Christ? What does that verse mean to you? And I'll open up for a little bit. What does that verse mean to you? I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. Does that resonate with you? What do y'all, how do y'all take that, understand that personally? Just blurt it out. Yes. I think I was talking to someone similar, along similar lines just recently, that your call, God's given you a ministry and it has for all of us, mm -hmm. then you have to do that. You're, as Paul said, I'm constrained to the gospel. I, I have to do this and woe unto me if I know. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's what it means a lot of people Christians to Christ. No, it's not a matter of, I mean, there are days in our, in our natural self where we, I want to get up and go there. I don't yeah. want to do that. But then I think, oh, geez, I don't. I've got to do that. Mm, that's right. I that's part of it. Yeah, I like that. Maybe you're saying you're dying to your own dream of what your life could be. You're, yeah. you're dying to maybe what you do, desire, some of your desires. I want to be selfish. I want to lay oh, in yeah. my house. Mm. I, I sit on my sofa and drink coffee and watch TV. Oh, yeah. It is fun. That's right. Yeah, dying to some comforts. Yes. Well, back 20, 30 years ago, there was a phrase that came out during our generation that was so popular. What would Jesus do? And oh, yes. So it's a simple statement of that scripture. Not what would I do? Jesus do this. That's right. Yeah. And a lot of times those are very different things. What would I do versus what would Jesus do? But yes, he's. Man. Says, and Jesus went to the cross. That's what we should I think Connie, Connie has something. Oh, she's yes. unmuted. Go ahead, Connie. Or she's not talking. <laughs> Connie, are you there? Okay, I'm going to go ahead and mute you, Connie. Sorry about that. No, that's all right. Any other thoughts on this verse? I've been crucified with Christ. I think that person that says that. Uh, I guess has a really deep understanding of what happened, that what Jesus went through, and that that He died for us, everybody sins, and that they're wanting to be like Him. Mm -hmm. Okay, now they know that they may not be the one to be crucified physically on the cross, but mentally or emotionally, they're crucified with him also. Yes. And therefore, if they want to follow him, they want to uh, give up their life for others <clears throat> to know Jesus and to follow Jesus and to to understand what it, what it is to actually believe that Jesus is the Savior of the world. That's right. And scripture does talk about identifying with Jesus or identified in his death, identified in his resurrection. So yeah, there's a kinship there that says, Lord, I want to be with you no matter what it costs me. And that's crucifixion and that's resurrection. But we can't skip the, the crucifixion part and just go to the glory part. Jesus tells us to follow him through all of it, not just the good parts. Very good. Yes, follow. Oh, what, whatever I was in the past, I painfully crucified him. Yes. It, it was enjo I, most enjoyable, but it, to get rid of him, it was so painful. But I did it mm -hmm. for the life that I have. Right. The life in Christ. And there's, sure. a, there's a reference uh, verse in uh, off this that says, yeah. this is Romans 6, 6. It says, for we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. Very good. Yes, I love that. And yeah, Paul talks quite a bit about that. There's a something real that happens when you accept Jesus. Your old man dies, has no power, and then you're raised to life. And the power of sin is supposed to be broken. It's supposed to transcend it. Just like Jesus rose from the grave and defeated death, he's allowed us to do the same. And so those old habits, even though sometimes we still do those things, the power of it is broken. We're able to 
come out of the cycles of sin and of addiction and all because Jesus led the way and we just follow him through that. I love that. And the next verse, we'll, we'll park here in Isaiah 53. Talking about Christmas, Isaiah 53, one of the one of my most favorite scriptures in all of the Bible, the prophecy about Jesus and Isaiah. Isaiah 53, 6. And the crucified life, it's not a comfortable life. If you remember, Jesus talks about sending the comforter after he ascends to heaven. And uh, it's interesting he chose those words, the comforter. It's called the paraclete because he knew this, this life is not going to be comfortable for people that follow him. He knew that. He said, you guys are going to be hated by the world. People are going to try and kill you. They're going to throw you in prison. And they're going to do to you what they did to me and even more. So he said, but don't worry, the comforter is coming. So that should be a clue for us. Well, if he's sending a comforter just for us, maybe life is going to be difficult if we choose this path of following Jesus. And the crucifixion looks like that seed. Unless it falls to the ground and dies, it remains alone. The seed has to die. And we see this in the life of Jesus, Isaiah 53, starting in verse 6. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living, for the transgressions of my people he was stricken. And they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death, because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him, he has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I'll divide with him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul unto death. And he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. What we see in this passage, Jesus was seems like he was designed to die. He was designed for death. And a very interesting part of this, the prophet Isaiah says it, it pleased God to bruise him. It pleased God to crush him in verse 10. So my question for us personally, you guys can answer this. If it pleased God to crush his son, do you think there's times in life when it pleases God to, when he allows us to go through trials, through tri tribulations, or when we feel like we're being crushed, do you feel like there's, uh, there's moments where God is pleased with it? And uh, have you thought about that? Do you think God is pleased when we're going through a hard time because he knows what we're cruising ahead? What do you all think about that? It paints a little different picture of God. I don't know if he's pleased if we're going through a hard time. I think he's pleased to watch how we handle getting out of it mm -hmm. or handling it or whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. Because you may have created a hard time yourself that's yes, that's true and uh what just thrust upon you and you did something that wasn't correct and so it was god's way for you to show me show me you really believe in jesus and how you're going to get out of it how you're going to handle this mess you got yourself into yes. so maybe please that instead of that's a good point. A lot of times we feel judged by God, but it's just sometimes our own dumb decisions. <laughs> a lot of times, yes. Same. Okay. Uh, when I looked at this very particular passage that it pleased God, mm -hmm. that Christ is being bruised, mm -hmm. I said that God uh, has uh, kind of initially has a relationship with us, mm -hmm. human beings, his creation. But because of sin, sin separated us from him. Mm -hmm. And God uh, is pleased because this is an avenue to bring man back to him, to have that very relationship that has been separate, uh, thrown away by the devil. So uh, I believe that I see here that he's being uh, kind of like pleased that man is going to come back to him mm -hmm. through this very bruising yes. of his son. Yes. And likewise us, God is pleased sometimes when we go through so many situations in life because he knows that that very process we are going through will bring us back to him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we can feel that for our friends too that go through hard times. Part of you, you feel for them, you feel compassion. You're like, I don't want that to happen to anybody. But maybe part of you is also like, I know this will produce 
endurance or perseverance in their life. So I think maybe it's possible to feel both the, the grief and also the trust in the Lord. Something good is going to come out of this and maybe uh, some ways you can't see quite. But any other thoughts on this, Isaiah 53? Yes, it would be interesting, uh, this is off the point, but it would be interesting to know what that says in the Hebrew mm -hmm. uh, language, what that means. It means the same thing, what we're doing the same thing. Yeah, that is true. I speak Hebrew, but no, I don't. No. That'd be that'd be nice. <laughs> I'll have to look it up later. Okay, so I think in that moment it pleased the Lord to bruise him. That's when he put us, God put us above his son in importance at the crucifixion because he loved his son so much, but he loved us as well. And the only way to do that was to elevate us above the son in that moment. So sometimes when we go through trials and hard times, especially when you're ministering to others, then you know, it's his way. You're already saved, putting those unsaved people above perhaps yourself. Yeah, that's true. That's a good point. Yeah, because God knows. Yes, this thing. Would you? Yeah, would you take the life of someone that's not saved to save your own life? Or would? Yeah, it's a very interesting, interesting question. This is the second question. Follow up. When we face difficult times, say an illness or a circumstance, financial hardship, even the last two years of this pandemic. So say you're in a situation, should you always pray and say, Lord, deliver me from this situation or Lord, make this stop or Lord, would you provide a solution to this? And how are we supposed to know what's meant to be a trial for us to go through from God and what's supposed to be something we're supposed to cry out for deliverance? Because sometimes trials, maybe God allows them to happen to perfect us, to sanctify us, but how are we supposed to know the difference? And, you know, this has been a big issue with all the churches we've been at. Are we supposed to be praying, Lord, you need to stop COVID right now or Lord, this is judgment from you or lord this is going to bring people back to you how are you supposed to know the difference between maybe what god is allowing to happen to you versus some things are your own dumb decisions that happen to you how do you know the difference how do you know what to pray his will what are your thoughts his will pray his will that's it you want, that's it that's it <laughs> that's man, a safe bet man I, I would point out jesus prayed that, that the cup would pass from him he did that's true. so i mean so obviously it's not wrong to say, God, I really would like to see the Lord. Mm -hmm. But then we've got James on the other hand. Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its perfect result that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. That's very good. So, I mean, yeah, we, we need to balance the truth. But if it's back to God, what do you want me to learn out of this? How can I grow from this? And Really, I'm like out of it. Thanks. That was good. Yeah, I love those two perspectives. One is Jesus in the garden saying, please don't let this happen. And then you have yeah, the famous passage of James, consider it for joy, which you don't necessarily want to email that to someone going through suffering maybe right away. <laughs> hey, be joyful. What are you doing? Yeah. <laughs> but we get those two perspectives and then maybe superseding that is above all else, Lord, your will. No matter what I want, no matter what I think is best, I think it has to end. No matter how you pour your heart out, it has to end with God, whatever is <laughs> Is your will just both? When we are going through the <coughs> trials and tribulations, our prayer may be like what he taught in Lord's Prayer mm -hmm. lead us not into temptations so that we won't have the courage, uh, we may not have the courage to stand on the, uh, those tracks, but sometimes during the time of persecution a trial period people try to stray away from faith the temptation comes to them god is not listening to us god is not helping us so lord uh, that's why we pray lord lead us not in whatever it may be but keep me in that faith strengthen my faith be with me that that's I don't know whether it is for good of mine or anybody's or for your glory, but I want to be with you all the time. It is not in your country. Yes, I like that because it's difficult to know many times what is going on. And think about David in the Psalms. He's just pouring his heart out, saying all kinds of things. Uh, but that kind of marks his life. He's like, no matter what, God, I want to be with you. And he went through some difficult things. So we can take comfort in the Psalms. We know that God lets us, he wants us to pour our heart out to him, just be honest with him. 
Um, but at the end of it, to say, Lord, I need you. What I want your will no matter what. But uh, the prayer is, it's, it's kind of the examples given for us to just be honest with God and say, Lord, this is terrible. I don't know if I can do this, but if this is what's meant for me, give me the strength to be with me. Uh, yes, sir. I think it's about growing your faith, making it stronger. Because he can put you in a position where you have nowhere to look but up. True. Yeah, desperation there. Yes. And two pictures you can see, you know, to, so you talk about strengthening our spirit, you can talk about strengthening your body. Uh, so say you go to the gym, you start lifting some heavy things and putting them down, and that uh, breaks down the muscle, it builds up the muscle, you're putting stress on your body. That's kind of intended you, like, I want to do this to get better. But then say, you know, a, a car falls on top of you, you're trying to bench press that car. You know, that's a different situation where this is not something you chose, but both of those things are going to build you up. And one, you know, might be more preferable than the other, but what all the trials, can, James says, consider a pure joy because it's going to lead to that, that spiritual muscle no matter what. So, yeah, we have to kind of sometimes be content in just not knowing many times. There's a lot of times I'll respond to people's questions just with, I don't know. I have no idea why that happened to you. Don't know what God is trying to do. But the one thing I do know is that he's going to redeem whatever you're going through to, to strengthen you. And the most important part, he's going to be with you in that trial no matter what so I love that. any last thoughts on this um, yes my, sister my thought is um and whatever you're going through if you share that with your friends some of them who aren't believers and then they see that you have a joy external from pursuing your situation like that's something they don't understand but it's a good picture of, you know, yep. what you believe. yeah that's true when the world's watching how's the you know, especially how's the church going to respond when crazy things happen in the world? Everyone's watching, whether you think they are or not. They're they're seeing how you respond because you're different, and uh, hopefully the way we respond will point them to Jesus and and make them go home with questions like, "How are those Christian people so peaceful, so steady through these things? When no matter when they lose their job, lose a house, whatever, how are they so steady?" And that should open up some questions and stir some things in their heart. So I like to think about this, that please God to crush his son. Uh, some people view, some students that we, we spoke with, uh, they view God as some twisted, cruel tyrant who crushes people and delivers other people and you know, gets pleasure out of causing people pain because of passages like this. But it's not that God loves people going through pain, but he knows the, the end result, and especially his own son. He knew that if Jesus was obedient to death, even death on a cross, that there would be so much new life to sprout out of that, that from God's perspective, he said, this is such a worthy sacrifice to, for my son to go experience this so that we in this room can experience new life in Jesus. And Jesus himself, it says, uh, he'll see the joy set before him and endure. Uh, even Jesus himself was, was pleased um, afterwards with the result. So if seeds are designed to die in nature, and if Jesus, our example, was designed to die, can our calling be any different can we, you know, skip the cross and go straight to heaven and dance around? Or is there some things that we must go through also, uh, some sufferings and trials to refine us and purify us? So I encourage you, if you want God to use you in a mighty way, just ask him to crucify you again. If it's been a while, <laughs> say, Lord, put me on the cross, put me through something. Uh, kind of a, a prayer we love to tell people to pray is just ask God for patience. And then he'll send a bunch of stuff your way to really test you and, and strengthen you uh, we had a friend recently going through something and they're, they're kind of reflecting. They're like, man, I asked God for patience a couple months ago. Why did I pray that? It's such a dumb prayer. <laughs> so, you know, it's a, if you want to grow, it's a great prayer. Lord, make me a patient person. He'll send some maybe troublesome people in your life to, to test you. Uh, but uh, there's one man, Tertullian. He's, he's very famous in church history. He's actually from North Africa. He's from Tunisia. He was around very soon after Jesus died, around 130 AD. Tertullian, the famous North African author, he said this famous phrase, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. Have you heard that phrase before? It's historical Christianity. The blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. And the context he's speaking this in was very early after Jesus died, the Christians are just being massacred everywhere, all across the Roman Empire. They're just being massacred, burned, stoned, all kinds of things. And so he has this context so as the blood of the martyrs, this could be the seed of the church. This thing is going to continue. It's going to grow, even though it's oppressed. Because when a Christian is killed, you know, say you're, you hate 
Jesus, you hate Christians and you want to stop everyone from preaching about Jesus. So you can go and kill that person. This happens, you know, in a lot of countries, especially in Africa, especially northern Nigeria, all these places, a lot of violence. Um, if you want to silence gospel witness, you just go kill the people. So that silences their mouth, but the spiritual side, the spirit of that still goes on. So everyone that views that martyrdom, everyone that witnesses that or knew them, it's like you can't stop what God is doing. You can't stop the move of God. Like the pastor said in the service, you, it's futile to even try to stop the work of God. Because even if you silence every Christian on the planet, the, the blood of the martyrs, that the, the spirit, their testimony, the witness, it's still going to produce a result. And God's still going to use it. And the Lord takes advantage of that. So you can stop someone preaching physically, but you can't stop their, their life and their spirit kind of marching into people's hearts. And you remember uh, Saul, evil Saul in the book of Acts. He was at the stoning of Stephen. He was there holding, I think he said he was holding the, holding the coats. He was there watching everything. So could this be a, a major factor in his conversion where he saw Stephen, his face like an angel being stoned to death, and he's watching it, approving it. And maybe on that road to Damascus, he was thinking about these things like, why is this why are they doing this? These new, these heretics, how can they die so joyfully? And uh, maybe that was a big part of Saul's conversion, seeing the Christians die just well. And maybe that really messed with them. I think that messed with them on his donkey to Damascus and God finally kicked him off and made him land on his butt on the road there. Uh, so your life, it really does speak volumes to those around you. Because what does the world tell us to live for? It tells us to live for, for money, go out and make some money. Tells us to live for fame, go be famous. Tells us to live, uh, make a reputation for yourself or build a company or have real estate or do these things. Be powerful, have a good time, pleasure, be a hedonist, enjoy yourself because we're all dead in like 40 years anyway. You know, this is different things the world tells us to live for. But Jesus turns this upside down and he says, if you really want to live, then you're going to have to die with me. And it's so counter, I love it. It's so counter cultural. Uh, he says it's foolishness to the Gentiles, this gospel message, because it doesn't make any sense to live. You have to die. It doesn't make any sense at all to anybody unless you believe what Jesus is saying and have faith. And Jesus helps us leave a legacy, a life of purpose that truly does reverberate throughout eternity. And just to close, I just want to share a short story about one of my faith heroes, missionary hero that we look up to that kind of we're building on his foundation and we just got to visit Boston a couple months ago, and I got to see the birthplace of this missionary, Adoniram Judson. He was the first, one of the first missionaries to Burma, to Myanmar. And uh, just a short recap of his story, uh, just to inspire you with, a, with what is sacrificial love, what does this look like uh, for someone to live this out? So Adoniram and Ann Judson, they're in 1800s, they're old, old school, and they arrived in Burma in 1813. And back then, it was an unknown land. Only two Americans had ever been there before to this crazy, exotic place. And en route to the mission field, his wife actually miscarried their first child aboard the ship. So they're already, when they get there, they're dealing with the death of a child they were expecting. So it's a hardship there. And then the local language, Burmese, it took them over three years to even begin speaking and having a conversation. It took them three years. And he found a tutor and they spent 12 hours a day trying to learn this seemingly impossible language they're trying to learn. In those first three years, Adoniram and Anne, they were almost entirely isolated from contact with any European or American. They just got dropped off in Rangoon and it was just them. They had no, no one else that was near culture to them, just isolated. And then four years passed before Judson even dared to hold a semi-public church service. He didn't know how to speak for four years. And then he finally mustered up the courage and said, hey, let's try and preach to these people. And after that, their second child, Roger William Judson, died at eight months of age. And this is death number two in the family's legacy. And then, so the 12 year mark, it took the Judsons 12 years. They had finally had 18 converts. So after a decade and two years, they had 18 converts and he was able to translate the entire New Testament into Burmese. That's pretty good for 12 years, right? 12 years at a job, it's not bad. And once completed, Judson was almost immediately arrested by the government and put in a famous death camp and starved and tortured for 20 months while his wife fought for his freedom every day. And once he was released, his wife died soon after, just going through that toil and stress of trying to free her husband for 21 months. And then after she died, their third child also died. And that's deaths three and four. 
And now Justin is alone. This is 25th year in Burma as a missionary. And at the 25th year mark, he finally translates the Old Testament into Burmese. So they have a full Bible after 25 years due to this man pretty much alone. In that same year, he married a missionary widow named Sarah, whose husband had died next to them. And three of their children also would die in Burma. So this is eight graves they had buried in Burma. And this is the end of the story. In the 32nd year, Judson's new wife, Sarah, her health begins to plummet. So in an attempt to save her life, they sail back to America to recruit more missionaries because all the missionaries have died that they were working with. And on board the ship, his wife, Sarah, dies on the way to America. So Judson decides to continue on to America because there's no one left to do the work. And he's coming to recruit some people. And he lands in America in the Northeast. And he's from Boston, so he goes to that area to speak to churches and, and raise and mobilize. And uh, the, the witnesses of those services say that Judson, when he began to speak, he couldn't even speak English anymore. It had been 32 years of just being embedded in Burmese culture that he tried to address them, but he realized he couldn't, he lost, he kind of lost his, his original language. So he had to get a translator to translate these things. And he said, people, you need to come with me because everyone else is dead. So he meets a, a crazy lady when he goes back that agrees to marry him. This is his third wife. And they board a, a one-way ship back to Burma. And everyone knows at this point, these people are going to die there because there's they're old and they're not going to do they're, they're going to die there. He could barely speak above a whisper, but he was so his heart was so full of Burmese and the Burma people. And then when they get there after four years of working with his new wife, after 37 years total of missionary service, Judson dies aboard a ship and he's buried at sea. And this is a famous man. And this is the, the poem he wrote during his life to summarize these things. Judson wrote, in spite of sorrow, of loss, and of pain, our course be onward still. We sow on Burma's barren plain. We reap on Zion's hill. He says, in, in reflection, he says, in spite of all the sorrow he had experienced, all the, the wives and children he had buried in Burma for the sake of the Burmese people, for the sake of giving them a, a scripture in their own language, he said, we sowed on this barren plain of Burma, just barren, nothing there, but he left a legacy. And these two things Justin wanted to accomplish in his life. He had two goals. He said, Lord, let me accomplish these two things and I'll be satisfied. One, he wanted to have a church of 100 people in Burma. And the second thing was he wanted to give them a full scripture in their own language. So he did the scripture part, but by the time he died, he did not have a church of 100 people. But instead, he left 100 churches with over 8,000 people and believers in Burma at the end of his life. And in large part due to his influence, Myanmar still has the third largest number of Baptists even today. And they still use, you can look this up, they still use his scripture translation from 200 years ago because the people say it still captures the essence of our language, the heart of Burmese. They can't believe how he did this, but he just loved them so much and he put the scripture in their own words. And he also inspired a global missions movement the effects of which are impossible to calculate. So if you think about leaving a legacy with your life, you know, the world would look at the, the life of Judson and his family. They say, what a waste. Why would these people try to, you know, force these, these Burmese to accept the religion, to accept their culture? Then why'd they go through all that hardship, all that death and toil to try and, you know, assimilate these people into Christianity? So the world would say that's just a waste of a life. But in God's kingdom, we can see that since the Judson agreed to lay down their life, to leave comfort, to uh, leave their dreams, their ambitions, and kind of accept the call of God, that a legacy was, was left that's still bearing fruit today. So had Judson never been there, many things maybe would not have happened. But he's, he's left a legacy in this country. He's famous in this country. And uh, the, the work of God both ways was started because he chose to lay down his life. And they just did step by step, learning the language, evangelizing, translating one verse at a time. And just those small obedient steps they took and said yes to the Lord after 37 years, that ends up to be a lot of steps. So the longer we live with Jesus, you know, a lot of times we feel like it's a little step, God asking us to do little things. And we say, yes, Lord, I'll do this little thing. But on a trajectory of, you know, 60, 70, 80 years, all those little steps add up and you ended up going miles and miles with the Lord and leaving a legacy that only he could write, that it's something much bigger than we could ever do ourselves. So I'd love to pray with you. That's the end. I'd love to pray over you and just bless you for blessing us.
So, Lord, we, we lift you up and we glorify you. And we thank you this Christmas season, Jesus, that you set the example and you gave your life for us and you call us to do the same. Would you help us this morning and at whatever point of life we're at, would you help us to, to likewise lay down our life for others, to serve others, um, to surrender to your will? And would our prayers be marked with honesty, uh, just that raw honesty we can have with you, but at the end of it, we would be able to say, but not my will, Lord, but your will be done. Would you help us to look like Jesus? And Lord, we, we bless this class to you. Thank you for the people in this room. Thank you for the testimonies you've given each one of them. And thank you for the, the goodness and the blessings that you've poured out on each one of their lives. And I thank you that they've shared that blessing with Hannah and I and our family. And thank you that they've been uplifting us in prayer. I just pray you would um, bless them this Christmas season with family, with faith, Lord, and would you help us to all look more like you, Jesus. Amen. 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 That's all I have. Thank you for letting us be with you this morning. All right. Well, thanks, Matt. Appreciate it. Yes, ma'am. You were talking about, I just wonder if you were that are there some common misconceptions because they have so many I know about us as Christians. Are there any misconceptions that you found about Islam or the Muslim that uh, also, you know, that you Yes, from like our perspective. Yes, the kind of the funny thing is, whenever you meet a Muslim, they're always so. Even our dear friend uh, him that him has known for decades or fifteen years, uh, they're always like, "Hey, we're it's a religion of peace. Don't worry, it's peaceful. We're doing this peaceful." They're really concerned about America's view of them since nine eleven. So probably the biggest misconception they want to try and prevent is us thinking they're all terrorists and extremists. So they're very quick to tell us, hey, we're not like those people, especially with ISIS, to say, hey, we're not like ISIS. We're a religion of peace. We can coexist together, all these things. Uh, so from the American point of view, a misconception is that they're all radical, they're all extreme, they're all violent. So that's largely not true. Many of our Muslim friends are not that way at all, and they, they want us to understand that. Um, the second one is that most of them are not devout. So I said the biggest thing that surprised me is just the, the nominalism of the Muslim people, just incredibly nominal. Uh, the people we meet on the streets during is during Ramadan, during the holy month. And some people I'd be talking to, they'd be eating during the daytime. And we ask them, like, hey, you're not supposed to be eating right now. Like, even I know that. You're not supposed to be eating. <laughs> He's like, well, I only do that when my mom's around. <laughs> so I only fast when my parents are around. Yeah, it's, lot, it's exactly Christians, like, it's a lot like Christians, yes. Yeah. So I was struck by the nominalism of kind of the average person that you meet over there. And there's some that are just incredibly devout, but a lot of them are, it's their culture. It's like if you meet a person that's Christian, just by culture, by family, they don't necessarily go to the mosque anymore. They don't pray anymore. They don't have their prayer rug out. Uh, they're just, it's just, they love the holidays, but they don't even know why they celebrate some holidays. You, there's this big festival where everyone slaughters a sheep in the town. So there's, you know, sheep literally dying in every household uh, about, they celebrate the story of Abraham and Ishmael, they say, of how God provided for the sacrifice. So they all actually slaughter a sheep, which is, I think it's kind of a cool picture, but you'll ask them a lot of them, hey, why do you celebrate this holiday? And they say, oh, we don't know. It's just what we do. And it's like, look, it's in the story. They're like, oh, really? It's in the Old Testament? I'm like, yes, it's the story of Abraham. Uh, so it's similar to a Christian you would meet, you know, maybe an average person that I think every Christian knows why I celebrate Christmas. Maybe some don't, but even some of their holidays, they don't know the reason behind. So we, that's what I was surprised. We have about. Dorothy here wanted to chime yes, in. Dorothy. Dorothy, go ahead. Hello, Matt. Hello. Always good. Always good to have you. I I just wanted to say thank you for what you do, you and your wife Hannah and your kids. I you know it gives me hope that uh, the younger generation, uh, you know, because. Most times the older generation, we always feel like, oh, everything is so gloom and doom. The young ones don't care, you know, and, and to hear you even say that is the same disease. Let me use that word uh, in loose terms. That is also with other religions. So in other words, it's not just our children, Christian, children raised in Christian homes that are kind of falling away and just living their own thing. It's happening with Muslims, it's happening with other religions. So uh, I guess uh, even though it's not a good 
thing to see, but it's a it's a small consolation that it's not a failure just among you know Christian homes. Oh, what did we not do quite right? Why are the children not following? So you uh, you are a very strong inspiration in my heart that yes, you know, because God always says there's always remnant. There's God always has a remnant and you are one of the remnant in this, I don't know which generation you are, Z, whatever they are. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, but you are a remnant. And so I want to tell you that uh, we pray for you. Uh, I was kind of just dumbfounded though. Is Moroccan government very nonchalant to Christians being there because watching all those videos, I didn't think that would be sensible. But then I saw you showing videos of your friends that are already there and I'm thinking, oh, okay. The government must tolerate these Christian missionaries. Is that the case? So legally they don't tolerate missionaries, um, but I'm pretty sure they know what we're doing there because this, you know, it doesn't make a lot of sense for us to be there, but uh, legally, no, but in practice, maybe they tolerate us a little bit, at least for now. Well, I pray that they continue to, to tolerate you, and I just pray for peace for you and your family. <laughs> yes, <thank> you. <laughs> and, and be blessed, okay? Thank you yes, so God, much for what you do. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Great. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you. Yeah, as uh, John said, you are a ray of hope for all our parents. Yes. <laughs> We thank you and thank God, and we continue to pray. Yes, thank you so much. God bless, God bless you all. All right. Uh, thank you. And there's, thank something, you. there's something you forgot to tell us here again. Okay. You see, there was a communication you gave us last time to contact you guys mm -hmm. or to support you guys. You haven't told us again because it, when you say it again, it refreshes the mm -hmm. mind of the uh, brethren. Yes, that's right. Thank you for that. Yeah, so we're still, uh, we're almost done raising our, our support budget. So we are honestly need just a couple hundred more per month. So that's what we're looking for. We're always looking for prayer partners. So on the back table, there's our prayer cards that you can take and please remember us and pray for us. There's also little cards you can fill out your email address and we'll send you monthly prayer updates. But if you'd also, many of you are already on our monthly team, we would thank you for that. And many of you have given generous offerings to us. So if you'd like to do that, help send us out to North Africa next month, then we'll gladly accept that and uh, just rejoice that you're on our team in North Africa, reaching people every day. So thank you for that. Thank you, Sam, for reminding me. If you want to email feedback there, I'll take your emails down. All right. Signing out, guys, online. See y'all later. Thank you. <laughs>